Hi, welcome. I am so happy to be sharing this hour with you today talking about mangoes. So today we're talking about the king of fruits, mangoes place in Latin American cuisine and culture. I am Dr. Sabrina Falkier. I am a physician, an educator, and professor at two universities in San Diego and do lectures and hands-on cooking events for different universities, not just in the U.S., but Mexico as well. I'm a culinary instructor, a speaker, a consultant, and a podcast host. I am triple board certified in culinary medicine, lifestyle medicine, and internal medicine. And I'm the proud founder and CEO of Sensation Salute, which is a culinary medicine education and consulting company. But as we begin, first of all, disclosure. So this presentation was supported by an unrestricted honorarium from the National Mango Board. All opinions and ideas shared are personal and neither reflect the position nor have the endorsement of the National Mango Board. I am currently the board chair of two nonprofits. One of them is a National Culinary Medicine Specialist Board. And the second one is Allwood Gardens and Learning Center, which is located in San Diego near the Mexican border. And it's really near where I live. And last is that all information I'm sharing today is for informational purposes only. I am a physician, I'm not your physician. So if something rings to you where you wanna change some things with what you're eating, and feel that it may affect uh, your health care, please make sure to reach out to your medical team. Now, our learning objectives during our time together is to identify the geography of Latino and Latina culture, as well as growing regions of mangoes. The second one is to demonstrate how mangoes are culturally relevant in our incredibly diverse nation with varied eating patterns. Our third is to discuss the role of mangoes within evidence-based culinary medicine principles, Fourth one is to clarify the glycemic index effects of fruits highlighting mangoes in regards to chronic conditions. And last and absolutely my favorite part is to do this translational piece of applying the learned information to immediately work with our patients and clients in a culturally sensitive manner regarding the culinary medicine principles and mangoes. Now, who am I? I read my accolades, but this gives you a little bit more of an idea of why I'm the one coming and speaking with you today. So I was actually born and raised in Mexico City. In the picture on the left, you see me in the front row. And I was there because my father's family had actually moved from Switzerland during World War II. My grandfather worked in pharmaceuticals. He had this absolute passion for Latin American archaeology. So he asked for a transfer anywhere in Latin America. So in the mid-1940s, our family moved to Mexico. And essentially, I had my full upbringing, uh, Spanish-speaking school, the full culture of Mexico. And I loved the color and the chaos of Mexico City and the flavors, the smells. And with combined with that, I would also then go to Switzerland for several summers because at some point in there, my grandparents actually moved back to Switzerland. So I had the chance to also have that culinary side with the simplicity of going on a day-to-day -to, -day to seek out the foods for that very day. So go to the, going to the butcher and the fruit and vegetable vendor and making these tarts when fruits were in their peak season. So really the two aspects of this culinary piece that have been a part of me. So fast forward several decades, I went to medical school and practiced internal medicine in a multi-specialty group here in San Diego for almost 16 years. In 2016, I learned about culinary medicine and I was awestruck with this space where you could really combine my love affair of food and cooking with my practice of internal medicine. And really the piece of to be able to empower people with knowledge and not only knowledge about nutrition, but knowledge on culinary skills to be able to move their own personal needle forward in a way that felt genuine to them. So I found, um, essentially I came back from that conference and I Googled teaching kitchens and right away actually found Olivewood Gardens and Learning Center, which we're gonna go into more details later in the talk. And it was this beautiful marriage of the space where it's mainly Latino community. So I felt re-embraced by that, the space that I really had moved away from, not intentionally, but because of schooling and different geographic moves and the embracing and the, again, the smells and the color and the vibrancy that that space has, ha, brings me. So I was really like an artist for me. I decided to go back to school and I did a two-year culinary medicine um, certification through the Health Meets Food curriculum. I then decided to go back to school yet for another two years to do my lifestyle medicine board certification, which really looks at kind of the umbrella of six pillars of, of self-care. 
And I love mangoes. Most important, mangoes have been my favorite fruit since I was a little girl. The picture in the middle is actually a picture uh, that um, I took from, a, we were traveling in Mexico and we had gone to the farmer's market and came back with these gorgeous mangoes and actually asked the restaurant at the hotel if they could open them up for us. And this is how they came back. So that was in Chetumal, Mexico. Now, with that background, uh, we're going to get into the international world of mangoes. As we go through this talk together, I want you to take the time to look at the pictures carefully, the faces, the colors, the vibrancy, to get to know one of the parts of mangoes. I wish you could smell them. I wish you could taste them through this talk. But essentially, my hope and my goal is for you to get really a feel um, of what mangoes um what encompasses mangoes fully. So I welcome you to the gorgeous international space of mangoes. They are cultivated in most frost-free tropical and warmer, warmer subtropical climates. So this includes South Asia, Southeast Asia, East and West Africa, the tropical and subtropical tropical Americas, and the Caribbean. And once they're grown there, they're imported to the U.S. from Peru, Ecuador, Brazil, Guatemala, Haiti, and four regions of Mexico, specifically Oaxaca, Chiapas, Michoacan, and Nayarit. Now, before we leave this slide, I want you to see again the mangoes hanging from these gorgeous trees and the different colors they are. Um, also, the different farmers uh, that are growing our beautiful mangoes throughout the world. Now, where and how do mangoes grow? Here you see these beautiful leaves. If you've never seen mangoes growing, which many of us have not, you'll see um, not only do they grow on these beautiful plants, but the color of the flesh varies a lot depending on the type of mango. And here you see that kind of orangish yellow color um, and what we call a mango turtle. And here you can see on the picture on the right, you can see a uh, mango grower and assuming he's maybe somewhere between five and six feet tall. And you can see the tree is double his size. Uh, so there also you can see that the fruit is red, whereas on the picture on the left, you can see the hanging beautiful mangoes are green. Depending on the type of mangoes, when they're harvested really depends on if they're going to be eaten right away or if they're going to be shipped. And also the type of mango is, is essentially harvested at different points, depending on the, the specific type of mango that it is. And the six varieties of mangoes that are shipped into the United States include the honey or alfalfa. Sometimes they're also called champagne mangoes. You see that on the upper left. Then we have Francis, Hayden, Keat, Kent, and Tommy Atkins. You do not need to memorize this, but the biggest thing to realize is that look at the color of the flesh of each of these mangoes looks actually some of them more quite different from the other, and especially the skin. So if you are shopping for these and you're at the grocery store and you see these, what is considered a ripe mango will vary depending on the variety. So on the upper left with the honey or atalfo, they have this gorgeous yellow skin and actually um, are consider their peak sweetness when they're actually slightly wrinkly. Whereas the Tommy Atkins on the lower right, those have a more of a reddish green exterior and get slightly softer, but not wrinkly when they're ripe. And their flavor is a little bit different. Their uses um, culinary can be quite different as well. And as far as the availability by variety, so we are lucky enough in the United States to actually have access to mangoes all year round. In the purple, you see the the ones that are have some availability during those months, and then the green is a peak availability. And again, on the left, you see the six uh, varieties of mangoes that are imported. So the two main varieties between March and mid late July that are available are again the Tommy Atkins or the and the Honey Atalfo. And then we get the second peak of the Keat mangoes in August and September. So right around um, again that kind of late summer, early fall time. And then also this picture I actually took in my own neighborhood grocery store. So helping people understand, um, all of us understand when is a mango ripe? Uh, this is actually teaching us that wrinkles are good. So let's remember that in multiple aspects of life. But here we're talking about mangoes specifically. And you can see again, this is the honey or atalfo uh, variety. And when it has those slight wrinkles is when its peak of sweetness is at its best. So something to keep in mind. And when they are in peak season, uh, you can get some fantastic, um, some fantastic prices for those. 
Now, moving on to the cultural relevance of both geography and people. Here, we're going to talk about the cultural relevance of mangoes in the United States and to know that there are varied palettes and varied cultures. And my goal with this is to remember that Latino culture is incredibly diverse. And we need to ask people to understand people, not to make assumptions, not to do these global uh, generalizations, but to truly inquire and have a curious mind. People come from varied geographical regions and also varied influences. So as far as definitions, so Hispanic versus Latino. So Hispanic refers to a person with ancestry from a country whose primary language is Spanish. Compared to Latino and its variations refers to a person with origins from anywhere in Latin America, such as Mexico, South America, and Central America, as well as the Caribbean. So again, one is geography, one is language. And going on the language side of things, here we have a Hispanic culture world map. And as you look at this world map and we look at the islands on the right of the map, so that's the Philippines. And there was a big migration from the Philippines into South America really early on in the 14, 1500s. Other areas with Hispanic or Spanish spoken are Spain. And then you see a few areas actually in Africa. And then you see North America, Central America and South America. And in the lighter color blue, you see a lot of areas in the United States where Spanish is spoken. So essentially most of the Southern states, Florida. And as we're looking at the world map, I also wanna emphasize that when we think of Latin America, there has been a lot of different influences. So initially there was a Mesoamerican culture such as the Olmeca, the Maya, the Mixteca, the Inca. And in starting in the 1400s, there was a lot of movement of people through immigration and through slavery. So it brought people from Africa, from different parts of Asia, and that has created a very diverse nation and group of people. So again, not to be stereotyped or essentially generous, but really looking at people and asking. So at this point, I'm gonna share this beautiful video uh, that really brings me back. Every time I watch it, it brings me right back to being in Mexico City. I had the opportunity to be back in Mexico City really recently. And I it, this video just exemplifies, um, again, the vibrancy and the beautiful space that Mangos holds in Mexico City. So I hope you enjoy the video. Mango is, is everywhere in Mexican culture. go to the market and you find nine varieties of mangoes. There's no way around it. We definitely love it. When I think of mango, I think mouth-watering uh, sweetness. And this aroma that it has such an, an aromatic peak and then it explodes with a sweetness. Así que mi, mi, mi memoria del mango es pues prácticamente desde que yo nací. Hemos estado rodeados de, de muchos mangos eh, desde que yo era niño y, y de las primeras cosas que yo pienso como fruta es también el mango. Porque el mango verdaderamente es una fruta fundamental en la parte gastronómica de México, particularmente eh, cuando el mango está en temporada. Es entonces cuando todo el mundo casi olvida lo que, lo que hay alrededor y todos comemos mango. Mi madera favorita, y bueno aquí el mexicano la madera favorita es limpiarlo y comérselo, nada de que rebanar bien. Sabe más rico limpiárselo y comerse, que le, a que se coma una rebanada. Es lo más, es lo más tradicional aquí, que la gente lo limpie y se lo está chulando. I think it's the most uh, friendly fruit or the most friendly ingredient. I'm gonna, I'm not gonna say fruit. I'm gonna say ingredient. It's, it's more, more than that fruit because you can eat it just the way you eat the fruit, but you can go further. There's, there's a time of the year when you go to the market and you find nine varieties of mangoes, and all of them are very uh, different. So. We have traditionally used them for different things. You walk around Mexico City, you always find uh, this kind of cart that sells fruit salad or a mango on a stick. It, they look like flowers, no? Sprinkle some uh, chile. They're delicious. Hay algo muy interesante. En México somos muy festivos y hay muchos pasteles alrededor del año, pero a nivel casero casi nunca hay pastel. Y 
una de las uh, razones por las cuales yo después de investigar mucho tiempo es porque en México tenemos fruta fresca todo el año. Pero el mango ciertamente es eh, eh, como el rey de las frutas tropicales. Por sí es una fruta sumamente deliciosa que volvemos a lo mismo. Está considerada la, la fruta más sabrosa que tenemos en el país. So after seeing that video, hopefully you have a little bit more sense of, again, that beautiful space that Mangos plays. And again, that specifically showed us Mexico City. Now we're going to turn to culinary medicine. So looking at the science and getting to know culinary medicine, if this is a new term for you. So what is culinary medicine? So culinary medicine is a specialty in medicine, looking at evidence-based nutritional information, meeting the culinary arts. So moving that uh, definition along a little bit, essentially it's learning about nutrition to know the why and the how to cook in a way to eat. I should say, let me repeat that, to cook and eat in a way to prevent, improve and reverse chronic diseases. So essentially helping people understand the why. So what happens if somebody has a donut every day uh, and a sugary coffee? What happens with their blood sugar? What happens with their energy levels in the short and long term if this is repeated on a day to day? And then compared to what if somebody now knows that if they um, combine maybe a homemade granola with a uh, plain yogurt and some berries, what happens then with their body in the short and long term? And once you have that nutritional information of realizing what can happen with one or the other, then taking people into kitchens and that's learning the how. How do I cook in a way that I'm able to incorporate some of those whole grains, well thought out proteins, the fruits and vegetables in a way that works with my schedule, with my palate, with my interest in cooking, um, and with my budget. So all of those pieces taken into account. And the last, and this is the word that I love most of all with culinary medicine, is I really see it as a, a place of empowering. So empowering yourself, those around you, and your patients or clients to cook in a way that assists health in the short and the long term. And then when we look at these ways of giving information to people, to emphasize that to reach our audience, we need to know our audience. So the beautiful thing is that Harvard Healthy Eating Plate, which is, um, you'll see there both in French and in Swahili, that one is available for free P PDF download in multiple different languages. So when we know who our patient or client is, this can easily be printed and, and given to them to get that visual in their head. And then you see others, these are again, still pyramids, but old ways has done a fantastic job of really moving towards realizing that representation matters, not just as far as people, but the produce that is shown or highlighted and moving towards a place that healthy can look very different. It doesn't have to be the stamp that healthy is a very specific one food, but really showing people that we can love the food that we love, the flavors, the spices, and helping people understand what ratios and what components within our plate, adding herbs and spices that really ring true to us can really help again, move that needle. So I love that Old Ways has created these pyramids and going from the lower to upper, you have African heritage diet pyramid, the Latin American diet pyramid, the Mediterranean diet pyramid, Asian diet pyramid, and then the very a vegetarian and vegan diet pyramid. And last on the slide is on the lower left. That's another one in Spanish, La Pirámide de Dieta Latinoamericana. So again, just giving you an idea of how to highlight uh, foods in a way that really is more inclusive of the variety um, and again, the diverse uh, nation that we live in. And when we talk about um, what pattern of eating or what quote unquote diet is the one we're supposed to follow, When we look at culinary medicine principles, it is the dietary pattern of eating that is utilized most often. And when I say this, I want to emphasize that it's a pattern. And again, looking at the worldwide aspect. So Mediterranean pattern of eating or the Mediterranean diet, you do not need to live in the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, there's been some conversations about whether the Mediterranean pattern of eating is uh, Eurocentric, is it inclusive or not? And to remember that the Mediterranean Sea 
borders on the north, it borders Greece and Italy. On the south, it borders North Africa. So keeping that in mind, there is a huge variety of eating patterns, even within the Mediterranean regions. And again, I want to emphasize this is the pattern. And what I like to highlight with this are the blue zones. And the blue zones are essentially five areas all over the world where they have the most people that have had not only the no biggest number of candles on their cake, but also quality of life. So it's not just about the food. It's about other aspects such as community around somebody. And the five blue zones around the world are one is in Okinawa, Japan. One is in Sardinia, Italy. One is in Nicoya Peninsula of Costa Rica. There's Icaria, Greece. And the last one is in Loma Linda, California. And again, emphasizing that it is foods that are in their whole form, least processed possible, and predominantly from the plant kingdom. Now, going specifically into the Mediterranean diet, uh, one of the paramount studies that's used uh, when we talk about uh, culinary medicine and Mediterranean diet is a study by Tricopolo that was published in New, New England Journal of Medicine in 2003. It's based on a nine point scale and the nine points are the following. Number one, vegetables. Number two, fruits and nuts, which are lumped together. Number three are legumes, which are anything that grows in a pod. The next one is cereals, specifically whole grains. The next one is fish, incorporating fish into your eating pattern at least twice a week. The, third, the next one is meat and meat products, where less is better. The next one is dairy products, again, where less is better. And for both the meat and the dairy, for the meat, it's, again, unprocessed. And for the dairy, it's fermented. So essentially, it brings out the, the microbiome um, positive aspects of, of the dairy, such as yogurt and cheeses. The next one is alcohol in moderation, and the studies on the amount of alcohol that people should drink has continued to evolve. So with this study, it was looking at one alcoholic beverage for women per day and two for men. So essentially seven per week, but not to be saved for the weekend. And again, 14 for men not to be saved for the weekend and really to be eaten with meals. And then the last one is olive oil use. And this study looked specifically at olive oil, uh, but when we look at the pattern of healthier oils, um, avocado oil, canola oil, sunflower oil fit into this criteria as well. And what the study showed is that if somebody had a two point improvement, so if I am having a conversation with a patient or a client and realize they really haven't eaten money vegetables on a day to day, or they're not really sure how to cook with legumes, uh, how to incorporate them. And we have conversations and maybe we talk about a meatless Monday where they make um, vegetable tacos with beans or, and that would incorporate some vegetables. Or we talk about different ways of incorporating both those two. So if they do go from not eating vegetables and legumes regularly to eating them regularly, they get a two point improvement in their Mediterranean score. And a two point improvement decreases mortality by 25%, which is incredibly dramatic and fantastic. So this, this has been a really useful, you can print out the scoring system, you can have a patient or client do it as they're preparing to have a conversation with you. And again, this is something where you can set goals with a patient, smart goals work really well for this, and figure out what is something uh, that they could work on to incorporate more items that would increase their score. And moving into other studies, I'm not going to go into all these in detail, but to know that there is a lot of research on behind the Mediterranean pattern of eating. So it looks, at, for example, the PREDI-MED study, which is a paramount study, first published in 2013, republished in 2018, and it looks at the primary prevention of heart disease. So this is this is for people who have a risk factor for uh, heart disease, but have not had an event yet. And the groups that had um, either nuts or olive oil had a significant um, reduction in primary, um, essentially of an event, a uh, heart disease event. The second um, point there is the secondary prevention of heart disease. So this is the Leo Heart Trial published in 1999. And what I love about this is that it's very doable. So if somebody has a heart attack or stroke before they leave the hospital, they have a pre-discharge information session, learning about the Mediterranean pattern of eating. And just by having one session, there was a statistically significant reduction in secondary events. So 
what I love it is that this is doable. This is something that can be incorporated into our current um, health system. The next one is looking at dementia risk and disease. And there are two major studies, one published in 2018, where it was the med diet and Alzheimer biomarkers. And then the second one was published in 2023. And then the last category, um, just to highlight, these are highlights, of course, there are multiple hundreds and hundreds of other studies, is looking at lower cancer risk. So this is looking at adherence to the Mediterranean diet, uh, and it's a systemic review and meta-analysis published in 2017. And now starting to translate. So now that we know Mediterranean pattern of eating is good, and here we are highlighting mangoes, how do mangoes look in all of this? So if we look at the nutritional facts of mangoes, this is looking at a three quarter cup pieces, which have 70 calories. And the highlights here are that from that three quarter cup of fresh mango, you get 50% of your daily need of vitamin C, you get two grams of fiber, it's naturally sweet, so no added sugars, but there's natural sweetness in mango. You also get 15% of both your folate and copper levels and 8% of vitamin A and E. And again, these are the, the big highlights here. And now we're going to look at a specific study looking at mangoes. There are several different studies um, looking at polyphenol levels, anti-inflammatory activities, bioactive compounds. There's, um, there been, there's been a pilot study looking at levels of obesity. So looking at weight loss, body composition, and inflammation levels with mangoes, looking at constipation. Uh, also prebiotic potentials and the role of mango with our gut microbiome. In this talk, I'm going to emphasize one specific study. And again, this is looking at the glycemic index and mangoes. So the effects of mango consumption on cardiometabolic risk factors and overweight and obese adults. So in this study by Rosas et al. that was published in 2022, there was a comparison, uh, essentially two groups, and there was a, a low-fat cookie group and a mango group, and each one had a daily consumption of 100 calories of one or the other for 12 weeks. And after those 12 weeks, there was a four-week washout period, and then there were essentially, this is a crossover design. So then they flopped groups and did the opposite of what they had been doing uh, for the next 12 weeks after that four-week washout period. This study had 27 participants who were either overweight or obese with a BMI over 26. And the results show that the mango consumption showed a significant improvement in the C-reactive protein, in blood glucose levels, in the AST, which is a liver marker, and antioxidant capacity. Also, there was no significant change in body weight, body fat percent, blood pressure, insulin levels, or lipid profile. Now, in comparison, the cookie consumption group shows significant increase in body weight, insulin levels, the C-reactive protein, and triglyceride levels. So looking at one of the charts from the study, uh, essentially this again looks at the effects of mango consumption on glucose and insulin in overweight and obese adults. And what it showed is that mango in intake reduces glucose concentrations. So looking at the two graphs here on the left, the Y axis is glucose levels and the graph on the right, insulin levels are the Y axis. And looking at first the one on the left with the glucose, the first group that you see is on the left is a mango group. And the group on the right is the low fat cookie. The white bar is at baseline, so at time zero, the light shaded, gray is at week four, and then the dark shaded, darker shaded gray is at week 12. And what you can see is with the mango group, as the time went on, the glucose level slowly decreased. Whereas for the low fat cookie group, it pretty much stayed the same. And then looking at the graph on the right, you see that for the insulin levels for the mango group, essentially overall stayed the same. And then the low fat cookie group, uh, as the weeks went on, the insulin levels continued to rise. So we have a glimpse of the science and the translation of the science. And now we're going to go into where science meets the kitchen. This, again, is my favorite part of the work in culinary medicine, is having people be empowered of what to do right away uh, with information. And the next time they choose a snack or a meal, that they feel empowered to make decisions that really helps their health. So the basics for culinary is, again, here we have a 
beautiful display of a powerful mango mangoes. And you see in the bowl, there's actually one that has those wrinkles, like I mentioned, that shows that it's peak sweetness. And mangoes essentially have a large pit in the center, which is flat. So when you cut, you're essentially cutting on one side and then the other side of that large pit. So you end up with two cheeks, as we call as we call them, and you can make these uh, cuts in them in both directions and then invert them. And that's how you get your, your turtle that you see on the upper left on this. Some of those mangoes you see on the cutting board may not quite be uh, peak of ripeness yet. And the beautiful thing with mangoes is you can use them with different areas of ripeness. Now the mango flower, you'll see actually mango.org has incredible amount of recipes available and they actually have videos too. Like there's a video on how to make this mango flower. But when we think of how to enjoy mangoes, you can start with the simplest form. So essentially just enjoying raw mangoes and you can keep it as simple as literally using a stick like you saw in the video and enjoying it that way. You can make a gorgeous mango flower. And you can make the turtles and literally just enjoy it. And some people, you've even, when they're really ripe, you can just take a little piece off the skin and suck the pulp out of the mango itself. So again, we can highlight that you don't always need to cook a fruit um, or a vegetable to really enjoy the beautiful flavors and colors that it brings us. Now, as we move on to adding other aspects to our mangoes, I want to just pause and just talk about culinary aspects in general. So as I mentioned before, that the Lat uh, Latin America and um, Hispanic people and culture are really, really incredibly varied. So when we think of Mexico and Latin America and all the parts of the United States that have people who again, are either migrated directly or descendants of people from Latin America or Hispanic countries, there are going to be worldwide dishes and flavors from all over Latin America, including in influences from Mesoamerica, Africa, Europe, and Asia. So when you're thinking here, different spices and herbs and the five senses or the five flavors, so sweet, salty, sour, bitter, and umami. Umami is a fifth sense of taste and it's a savory flavor. So we get it from things like Parmesan cheese or cheese in general, from tomatoes, from mushrooms, to name a few, soy sauce, for example. Um, mustard has it as well. So that is, when I think of these, when we're cooking or preparing a dish, it's as if having all these magical tools that you can add. So I think of it as a symphony where each of these flavors brings in a different instrument. And sometimes you choose to have more than one instrument, like bringing in sour from two different aspects. And remember that you do not need to be a culinarian. You do not need to be a chef to know or feel comfortable with this. There are resources available to learn and be inspired from. And also let your patient and client guide you. So keep that in mind as you're having these conversations on how to help somebody move their, their health needle forward. So now we're going to make a way around that plate that we in, uh, talked about a little bit before. So again, starting with hydration, ideally hydrating again with water. You can also do spa water where essentially you can dice mangoes and add, add uh, water to a pitcher and you can have mango infused water throughout the day. You can add some mint leaves in there as well. You can also do muddled fruit or blended fruit in drinks. On the right there, you see it almost looks like a mango mojito where you have mint. There could be some lime in there as well and mint, and you could add sparkling water. And it's a beautiful mocktail that you can have. And again, incredibly refreshing. And to remember, you are using the whole fruit. So you are blending, you are not removing the fiber. So you're adding these natural ingredients and creating hydration in a way that does not use added sugars or artificial sweeteners. An example here is a blended mango limeade. So again, this is the idea of adding ingredients like you have your mango, which has a natural sweetness. You'll have your, your lime juice, which brings in the sour. You might want to add some mint. Um, you can also add again, crushed ice, depending on how, uh, what texture you want from this drink. And absolutely remember that depending on your mango, sometimes you need to add no additional sweetness. So again, you don't always have to have all five, 
five flavors when you're creating a dish. In a drink like this, again, you'll have the, the balance between the sweet and the sour of your two main ingredients. And again, you can have this with sparkling water, but again, a way to have a meal that is made from whole foods, and in this case, a hydration, a drink, uh, without, again, the added sweeteners. And some people would argue that, well, this still has sugar in it. But again, the sugar that it has is a natural sugar. And what are they moving from? Okay, so somebody is drinking soda all day or fruit juices that have absolutely no fiber. And you're slowly moving that needle to have natural sweetness. Not only are you reduce, reducing the amount of added sugar, you're also slowly acclimating their palate to flavors that come from nature rather than ultra sweet flavor that comes from added sugars or artificial sweeteners. And then the next piece is adding more from the plant kingdom. So more fruits and more vegetables. And here you see highlighted the big picture in the middle is as you saw in the video is just the highlighting of fresh produce. And you see these stands everywhere in Mexico City um, and other parts of Mexico as well, with just cut up fruit that is fully in season. Sometimes nothing's added. Often, like you see in the upper left picture, it's adding lemon and either tajin or chamoy. And again, the highlight here is the fruit itself. So you're adding some more complexity again with those spices. Some people like to add a little salt or otherwise, but the main ingredient is that fresh fruit. And then on the upper right, you see a picture of a salad being made with fresh mango. You have tomatoes, which again, bring in that umami and some sour as well, and some basil leaves. And then the dressing that I would put on that, that's yet more pieces to that symphony, depending on what I chose to flavor my dressing with. Here we have a spicy mango salad. So again, highlighting yet again, more from the plant kingdom. And in this one, it's actually Asian flavor inspired. So the uh, dressing that you see there on the left, it actually has uh, rice wine vinegar and white vinegar. So again, two different acids coming in here. And then you have your cucumbers, you have some peanuts that again, by dry roasting them, you bring out more flavor, you bring out a crunch in there, cilantro. So really fresh, really fantastic that you can eat on its own, or you can have it over grilled fish or chicken. And again, adding more complexity of flavors. Now, when we're talking about protein in general, there is a term called protein flip that's used in culinary medicine a lot. And it's really thinking about using, instead of thinking about your plate filled with one giant piece of meat, um, of whatever type of meat you like, of really thinking about animal protein as a condiment. So thinking about also adding more proteins from plants, such as beans and lentils or tofu or unprocessed animal sources. And going back to that plate we showed is that your protein is one quarter of the plate at the most. Letting the plant kingdom be the center stage, all those colors and textures that can come from your fruits and vegetables. And then also let plating guide you. So sometimes you don't have to have toddler separated plates to have that quarter, but thinking about your ratios of really thinking about the protein being a quarter of the plate. So what does this do to the nutritional intake? So it increases fiber, vitamins and minerals. It also helps decrease consumption of saturated fats that we get from animal sources of protein. And it's also lower cost. So if somebody does buy four large pieces of meat that fill up the whole plate, and now you're buying one for a family of four, and you're using um, the essentially what you did not spend on all that animal protein to buy fruits and vegetables that you're then chopping up and mixing with your, uh, with your highlighted or with your chosen protein. So for example, the lower picture really shows this beautiful grain bowl. So on the bottom, it could be any whole grain in there. If you do rice, the darker you get with the color of the rice, the higher your protein and fiber content will be. You can also use something like quinoa or bulgur, for example, and then topping it with all these different sources. So there you see small portions of beans and you have a yogurt uh, that again is fermented and yogurt can often take the place this is plain yogurt that can take the place of something like sour cream and then there are small pieces of either fish or chicken so those little pieces are filling up about a quarter of our ratios and then you have the pico de gallo which is your tomatoes onions uh, jalapeno or serrano mixed in there the mango 
other grilled vegetables on the side and then drizzle with the acid. So you're bringing in again, that beautiful symphony of flavors, textures. And when I look at this bowl, I see plentiful, I see color, I it's craveable. And that's the goal that someone doesn't feel deprived because you're telling them to have less meat. You're highlighting these other aspects of it. And often people within a week or two will feel so much better physically, which also helps uh, encourage continued, um, continued, I won't say compliance, but I don't like that word, continued excitement about putting in the effort to, to move their needle with what they're choosing to eat. And then when we look at whole grains, again, that other quarter of the plate, you see different options here. So on the upper, Two pictures. So here we have corn tortillas. So corn is a whole grain and tortillas made in their most natural way with the nixtamalización process, which uses corn and lime to break down the corn and make the B vitamins much more bioavailable. That is what most corn tortillas are made traditionally. So if you make corn chips, you know, teaching yourself and then others how to make oven baked tortilla chips. And then again, using soft corn tortillas for your tacos, if you're used to, or you're working with somebody who always has a, the hard taco shells that you buy, you can actually bake them uh, with very little oil or no oil at all to be in that shape. And again, then you are controlling the type of fat that's used um, to create these crispier um, tortillas. And then in the lower pictures on the left, you have pita bread or non bread, which again, Asian inspired dish with a curry uh, and there's some beautiful mango curries actually on the mango.org um, website that play on these beautiful natural sweetness and the spice. And so there you have two potential whole grains. So the pita or the naan, as well as your rice. And then on the lower right, there is um, essentially a grain bowl. And I want to emphasize, so on the lower left, you see there's white rice. And remembering when we're looking at whole grains, we are going for a quarter of that plate. If somebody has been eating white rice for their whole life, we're not going to move. We're not going to take away their rice. It's really the education part of saying, can we, can we add more again, fruits, vegetables? Can we, are there places where they can work on other whole grains? But again, if somebody has been eating white rice and it's part of their upbringing, their flavor profile, we are here to add rather than a feeling of deprivation or vilifying somebody's day-to-day uh, -day food. Another example for looking at, again, that protein flip or full dish is a mango and tuna ceviche. So here you have diced cucumbers and uh, raw tuna and mango, cilantro. And the beautiful thing with this is with those main ingredients, you can now move towards making it a coastal Mexican dish with jalapenos, um, lime juice, and, and a lot of cilantro. The other option, and there are multiple options, but I'm just showing you two here, talking about two here, is we can make it Asian inspired. So same cucumber, the mango, the tuna, but now we're using sesame oil, we're using um, soy sauce, we're using ginger to create a more Asian flavored inspired. This does not move it away from being a Latino. As I mentioned earlier, again, they were migration patterns, movement uh, starting in the 1400s from again, Africa, Asia, and Europe. So keeping that in mind, again, this is all still within Latino influences. And then last, as far as looking at different ways of eating is another term that's used a lot in culinary medicine is the dessert flip. So truly thinking about uh, fruit forward desserts. So in the right upper, you can look at just, again, your simple turtle, and that could be it. Full, simple, plain, gorgeous, and a way to wrap a meal up. By the time we get to dessert, we don't usually still need food. We're not usually hungry or need more calories. It's really just wrapping our beautiful meal that we've had with a bow. So when we look at foods, we think of these three pleasures of how to finish a meal or a snack is things like chocolate, nuts, and fruits. And mango is a beautiful way because of its natural sweetness to make a simple bow at the end of a meal. On the left, you see an ice cream and mango ice cream can be made with two to three ingredients only and none of those are any added sugars. In the middle, you see a gorgeous mango trifle. Uh, that is a labor of love right there. Uh, and if somebody showed up at my house with that as dessert, I would be in heaven. 
So again, emphasizing that a dessert does not have to be complicated. It can be simple and a beautiful way. Again, that beautiful bow at the end of a shared meal. And as we get to the end of our time together, um, our last quarter, I should say, I want you to think about, um, again, these beautiful faces that you're seeing in front of you. As I mentioned, I've been involved with Olivewood Gardens and Learning Center since 2016. So these gorgeous faces, they're all Kitchenistas plus one son that you see, uh, taller, taller than all of them combined, I feel. And I have gotten to know these women and um, their families so much. Um, they have an eight-week program. Essentially, Olivewood Gardens and Learning Center has programs for all ages. But one of the main programs is called Cooking for Salud. It's an eight-week program free for participants. And at the end of the eight weeks, they graduate and become kitchenistas. I went through the program in the fall of 2016. They call me an honorary kitchenista, and it truly is an honor. There was actually a documentary, um, actually two. There was a short documentary made in 2016 or released in 2016, and then a second full feature uh, that was released in 2021 that was selected for 10 film festivals. And I had the honor not only of being in the film, but also being able to travel to these film festivals and talking about culinary medicine nationwide and actually internationally as well. It was such an incredible space of having people see that culinary medicine does not have to be sterile in a medical environment, that we can take this language and this conversations about moving ourselves and our community to a healthier space, one community at a time. So I'm going to tell you a couple stories of some of the kitchenistas here. So this is Kitchenista Rosa. Uh, so she actually shared this a uh, beautiful story of that she is a recent, um, she just recently went through chemotherapy for breast cancer and she is now in remission and she was very happy to share that as well. But Rosa wanted to share with you how when she was going through chemotherapy, her taste buds were incredibly affected. And the one food that really carried her through is homemade mango smoothies. And she is so thankful uh, to have a food and thankful that mangoes really found the way into her life since childhood, but really played this role when she was going through chemotherapy. And she just was so happy to have a space to share that story with it. So I'm happy to share that with you. And then we have Kitchenista Tania, who here she is with her two children, Aiden and Mirabella. And they have had, um, they travel to Baja California regularly, and one of their favorite places to travel has these gorgeous mango trees. And uh, Kitchen Satania shared these pictures of her entire family on, in front of this most likely 20 foot tree. It was, it was enormous. And then Aiden wanted to show me how he loves mangoes and how he chops mangoes. So, on the picture of the right, you see Aiden telling me the story of how much he loves mangoes, how often he eats them. And here he is just happily chopping away at this gorgeous, gorgeous mango. Then we have Kitchenista Rosina. Uh, she is uh, an amazing human being. I have known her, um, again, she and I went through the Cooking for Salute program together. Uh, each, of the, each of the cohorts that it goes through, we call them a generation. So she and I are both from the ninth generation. And Kachinisa Rosina actually grew up in Sinaloa in the northwest part of Mexico. And her father actually transported mangoes from the farmer to the next part of the shipping process. And she shared these stories of how much she loved and cherished the few times that her father allowed her to go on the truck with her. But one of those times, uh, I don't know if you've ever been to Mexico, but they have these giant trucks that are just filled to the brim with whatever um, produce is being shipped. Uh, the whole truck fell over and she was fine. Her mother was in the car too and her father, they were both absolutely fine. But that was such a core memory. I mean, mangoes spilled everywhere. People from the community came and really helped uh, load up that truck again. Everything was fine. Truck was fine. Um, and the next time they loaded it just a little bit better. Uh, but she is just so passionate about what she brings to the world and the memories that mangoes have been in her life. It wasn't just about the produce. What she really talked about is 
the connection that her father made with the people that he worked with, who he was picking up the mangoes from, knowing their families, knowing all the different parts of knowing that him moving those mangoes from one place to another was going to help bring money into the families and the communities that he was picking up the mangoes from. And I can picture Rosina almost in this picture. I can almost see her 11 year old self um, in that space. And she, again, was just so happy to, to share that. And last, I'm going to share the story of Kachinisa Teresa. She uh, wanted us to know that she actually, she's diabetic and wanted you to know that. And to know that when she went through the Cooking for Salute program, she really moved to making all her desserts from whole fruits. And mangoes are especially highlighted in that. She's from Guadalajara, Mexico. And this mango in front of her is actually her favorite. She calls it petacón. Um, and it is her favorite mango to work with. And again, she loves making desserts with them. Um, and she has seen anecdotally that her blood sugars, when she uses uh, fruit forward desserts, her blood sugars don't go up. So some highlights of the amazing people, amazing women that I've gotten to know um, for seven, eight years now. So finishing up in conclusion, so why? Why mangoes? Because they're nutritionally dense, they're unprocessed, they're versatile, they're naturally sweet, and they're delicious. And then how? So how do we enjoy these ourselves? How do we incorporate them into conversations with our patients or clients? So number one, find out someone's palate. Ask, always ask. Also be culturally sensitive in our conversations and inquiries, and always asking to learn before making any recommendations. Also giving culturally appropriate recommendations and remember that one size doesn't fit all. We are all, one of the things I love about food is how personal it is, how it really connects us uh, to our, to people around us, to communities and to honor that and not come in with a one size fits all approach, but to talk to somebody, find out if they are sweet snackers or savory snackers or what are specific mic spice mixtures or favorite dish that their grandmother made or they love to make or they wish they could make and have that be a starting point because that comes from a place of inquiry and being curious about who you're talking to as a human being. And that will help build a trust and to be able to make recommendations that will be built on one after another. And then introducing options, depending on one's cooking styles and abilities, their time available to cook or shop, their budget, palate, food, cultural history, preferences of spices, tastes, and textures. Now, recommending, again, evidence-based recommendations, meaning recommendations rooted in evidence-based nutritional information. So all of us are bombarded with sources of information. Some are credible, some less credible. We may also have our own specific anecdotal information of, of eating pattern or diet that either worked for us or somebody we know. But to remember that when we are professionals working with patients or clients, that we need to remember to stay in that place of evidence-based nutritional information. And also remember, as I mentioned earlier in this talk, we do not need to be experts in everything. One of the parts that is absolutely my favorite about culinary medicine is to bridge the silos between different disciplines. So culinary medicine often is a group of physicians, dietitians, chefs, health coaches, to name a few, and to reach towards each other's areas of expertise. That is what's going to help move ourselves and the discipline of culinary medicine forward because we know certain aspects. We cannot know it all and realize there is enough room in culinary medicine for everybody. There's so much work to be done in the space and to really reach out and again, bridge those, um, bridge those silos of communication. So with that, I'm going to share with you, I'm going to stay on the slide just for a little bit. This is a bibliography of the sources I use throughout the talk. And again, this is just a sprinkling of studies and information sources on culinary medicine as a whole. I encourage you, if it's something that interests you or you know some about or wish to know more, to look into those resources. Again, you can also reach out to me. Mango.org is a fantastic resource. If you have not been on their website, I highly encourage you to do so. 
And last but not least, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. And again, you can reach out through my email, info at sensationsalute.com, my website, sensationsalute.com, or social media, Sensation Salute. So I thank you so much for this beautiful time together with you. And again, I'm Dr. Sabrina Falke, founder and CEO of Sensation Salute, which is culinary medicine, education, and consulting. Have a fantastic day.